which what it will do is it's a language that looks very much like Python. However, you can also explicitly write code that looks a lot like C code as well. Um, it looks like Python, but you can declare C data types and call C functions. And what happens is a compiler called Cython turns that code into C code, which is then compiled with the C compiler, and then um, automatically linked into <laughs> your running Python session. So what it does is it deals with all the reference counting automatically. It means that you don't have to learn anything about this Python C API at all. You can completely ignore its existence. Um, and you can still get fast code that benefits from the C level. So you can write code that uses this, but you don't have to know much more than how to program in Python. You just need to know a little bit more than programming in Python. Yes, Ben? If you download Python, does that include, a, like, does that include Python with it? Or do you have to download something? No. Um, if you download Python for any operating system by itself and want to use Cython, then you also have to download Cython. Cython is itself a Python program. It's not that big. It's very easy to download. Um, also, you can, you can um, easy install it. That is, you could say Python setup py, or sorry, what is it actually? There's, well, I mean, it's available for all the standard Linux OSs. It's very easy to install um, into Windows and OS X as well. And there's a download link right here. Um, you can get the gzip tarball. It's a very standard program to install. And it's written in Python again. Um, so it does not come with Python. Um, I have talked to Wido Van Rosen. I had lunch with Wido Van Rosen, the guy who started the Python project and leads the project, and talked to him about Cython and um, told him that one of our goals is that it... So, by the way, I, I uh, made up the name Cython and kind of got the people to work on the project. Um, and I can tell you a little history about that in a minute, but, um, but I haven't written much of it. I'm not like, super good at writing compilers like some people. But um, we want Cython to eventually be included in Python. And when I discussed it with Wido, um, his main remark is that once code gets into Python, it should be very, very stable. It's where code goes to die or something, or you know, live a long but very stable life. And Cython is still under fairly active development in that there are you know, new features still being added, optimizations being done, and so on. And so it isn't quite, it hasn't been around quite long enough. I mean, it has been around for like 10 or 11 years, but it hasn't got to the point where it should be sort of frozen in time and, um, and included with Python. That was his perspective. I'm not sure I agree. Maybe um, Cython should just be included with Python. Uh, it's unclear to me um, whether when that should happen. It does fully support both Python 2x and Python 3x. So if you write a Cython program, it will work with two, it'll generate code depending on what options you use for the 2x version of Python or the 3x version of Python, which is very nice. So unlike Python itself, Cython code works on both systems, just by default. Um, okay, a little bit more, just a little tiny bit more history. So uh, I think around 2001 or 2002, a guy in New Zealand named Greg Ewing started a project called Pyrex, which is like the kind of fake glass stuff that you cook things in. Um, and it looks like, I guess, that trademarked term, so maybe it wasn't the best choice of a name. If you try to Google it, you get lots of stuff about glassware. Um, but it's supposed to be Python extensions. That's where the X comes from. So for writing Python extensions. That's why you called it Pyrex. And um, I found out about this after I decided to write something like this. So I read through the Python C API and said, finally, I found a system that I can write Sage in. And then I thought, well, I need to write my own thing to generate code that uses the Python C API. And then I found out about Pyrex and realized I didn't have to write my own code to do that because this already exists. Unfortunately, as a project, it had various issues. Um, it has issues, namely, this one guy, Greg Ewing, was, as far as I could tell, the only person that ever worked on Pyrex. And it wasn't his full-time job at all. It was something he seemed to do during you know, the Christmas break and every once in a while. So. Um, that was frustrating. Also, he didn't use a revision control system at all. Um, if you wanted to make changes, it, it was very hard to see what had changed from one version to another unless you tracked it yourself. He just you know, worked on some code on his Mac, uh, made a zip file, and put it on this website every once in a while. So, um, so there were those issues. And also, around, I think, 2006, it started getting to be the situation where People had forked Pyrex. There were a whole bunch of different forks of Pyrex that added various features. 
For example, I made up a fork of Pyrex, which added certain capabilities that um, were very important to me, but were not in Pyrex. So I called my fork um, Sage X, which was a very bad choice of a name, um, for extensions. And it had Sage in it, which is completely pointless, since it had nothing to do with Sage in particular. Um, and let's see, there was another, there were various other forks for other projects of Pyrex. So at that point, um, I decided that we needed to come up with a much better name and then get all the forks to combine their code together and get all the people sort of leading the forks to become the main developers of Cython. So I thought for a long time about names and I wanted something that involved C and Python. And so then suddenly the word Cython popped into my head. C, Python, it seems close. And then I thought, okay, I'll do a Google search to see if this is already a popular word. And at the time, when you did a Google search for Cython, here's what you would get. Lots of stuff about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently he's a punk rocker in England named Cython. Um, <laughs> so I figured that it was safe to use that name because he probably isn't going to sue me. He might flip me off, but that's <laughs> the worst of my, or that's the, the worst I'll have to worry about. And moreover, it would probably be easy to get more popularity than he has for this project, and hence when you type Cython, my project would be the top hit. So he was my main competition for the word, so I thought, okay, it's probably a good choice of name. Uh, I'll let you do the research. All you have to do is type Cython into Google and do it, and you'll find it a little bit. So you can figure it out. So now, if you, as you can see, Cython comes up quite a lot. This is one of the lead developers of Cython, by the way, DAG. Um, and if you just do a normal search, it you know, comes up all over the place. Yes? Oh, that's Dag Svergud. He's some, like, I think Swedish guy. I think Swedish. I don't know. Um, I've met him many times, but I'm not sure what country he's from. He's from a Scandinavian country. So here he is. Maybe in Seattle. We had a Sage Days, we had a Sage Cython Days in this very room a couple of years ago, which he came to. In any case, there are, there are many um, Cython developers, and let me just show you the people. So the core developers are this guy, Stefan Benel, which was in charge, he was in charge of one of the forks. I started the project by making a website and listing him as one of the main developers, and he said, well, I think it's a good idea to start this project, but don't make me one of the main developers. But he's since then done an enormous amount of work on it. Um, Robert Bradshaw was my PhD student at the time and now works at Google over in Fremont, like two miles, two or three miles from here. Um, and then I don't know who Lissandra, I don't know some of these other people. I think Lissandra is from somewhere in Central America, maybe. Um, I don't know the other two people and Dag is the guy whose picture just was there. Um, and then there are tons of other contributors. And there's been financial contributions and so on. And in fact, Cython is very popular these days. Um, see, I think the summer before last I went to Paris um, for a conference on scientific computing using Python. And it was a you know, large conference. And I think every other talk explicitly mentioned use of Cython, that they had used it for their project. So it was very, very popular among at least scientific computing people. Okay, so that's kind of the background on Cython. Um, that's where the name came from. This is the website for the project. Those are the people that are involved. And now the rest of, really, the week is just going to be about how to use Cython and what it actually looks like. Okay? Any questions? Yes. Sure. No way. Exiziting. Oh, you're right. <laughs> it's exiziting to see that there are several. Ah, thank you. Um, I'll tell you how I'm going to report this error. Uh, I'm going to email Robert Bradshaw. <laughs> Or maybe I should email the list. Actually, there's a Cython mailing list, so Cython dev, that makes sense. Uh, typo on the Cython.org website. Uh, a student, what's your name? Capitalize what? Okay. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, in Python. Uh. Oh no, ironic. Web's it. 
OK, so there you are. So now that's been reported. Any other questions or comments or typos? <laughs> OK, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to sh take one sample problem and then write various versions of code to um, solve the problem. And um, here's the problem. Define a function f of n, which is the sum as i goes from 1 to n of sine of i. OK, so sine of 1 plus sine of 2 and so on. But we're going to try to evaluate this function. Um, I had actually originally written this to use uh, just the sum of the first n integers. But it turns out that the compiler in the latest version of Xcode is very optimizing. And it optimizes out any loop I can think of involving a polynomial in n. And just does it by a, some closed formula, which is great. And I don't know how to easily turn that off. So it would uh, mean that basically the Cython code for solving this problem is just in, you know, instantaneous no matter what input I give it. So um, in order to come up with something that will illustrate more interesting aspects of Cython, for example, how to call a function from an external C library, um, uh, more trying to find a more subtle closed form formula for a, for a big expression, et cetera, I'm going to use the sum of the signs of the first n integers. This is also nice because it probably isn't immediately obvious to everyone here how to do this in one simple closed form formula, whereas with the sum of the first n integers, that's probably something most people will will have sort of been, been exposed to since it's so commonly known. OK. So I'm going to show you several approaches to computing the sum. The first one is a very natural, short, simple looking thing. And it is horrendously bad. By the end of this worksheet, which may or may not be something we finish today, but I think we will, um, we'll see a version that is, let's say, quite a bit faster than this. OK. So let's start out with the very first one. What this does um, is, let's kind of break it down. I'll put some spaces in so we can talk about it. What it does on the inside is it sums up the signs of the first n integers. But, um, oh, and just to be clear, I don't want the answer as the formal sum of the signs of the first n integers. I want a floating point number. That is a standard double precision floating point number, 53 bits. Um, a base and then some, a, and then some exponent. Okay, so I want the answer as a double precision floating point number. So if I just do this, just to, I'll put it outside so you can see what you get. You get literally like the formal sum of the first n signs. Okay, so obviously that's not very satisfying as an answer. It's just a symbolic sum. It's exactly right. It's an exact you know real number, but it's, um, and you could try to you know simplify it maybe by doing dot full simplify, and it might do something. Nope, doesn't do anything. Um, so that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is a floating point version of this. Is that kind of space functionality? Yeah, this is, um, I can tell you what's being used, I guess, under the hood to do, well, in a sense, absolutely nothing. Um, so sine is a, is a function in Sage that you can feed it things um, like, I mean, it's a symbolic function. You can feed it pi, and it does something intelligent, um, pi over 2. So it knows various identities. Um, when you feed in an integer, it doesn't simplify it because um, because it you know it's there's no simpler form to put that in. Um, and then sum is the sum function in Python. And when you if you don't put the uh, list thing in here internally inside of this, it constructs a generator. Um, so it's like a lazy list and goes through and adds up all the things in that list. So that's what's happening here. Um, you could alternatively put, um, basically, if you don't put square brackets here, it will efficiently allow you to sum up what would be in that list without creating the list in the first place. It just, you know, gets each element. Um, it creates a generator expression on the fly. So it's kind of like, actually, it's kind of stupid because I should probably put X range. X range. OK, so that's basically what I'm doing. I'm computing this big thing formally and then taking the float of that. So it's really, you know, like it almost looks exactly like what we're talking about. Um, let's get the sum of the signs of the integers up to and including n, uh, but not including 0. And we want that as a double precision float. And it works. There's the answer. OK, it takes a noticeable amount of time to do this for the first 1,000 integers. 
Let's time it. So um, just to keep track of all the different things we do on the Blackboard, I will do um, this. It's called Python sum. I'm going to call it symbolic in that what it does is it symbolically evaluates the sum of the signs, which is just a formal sum with no simplification at all. And then it calls float, which actually goes through and changes all the integers in there into floating point numbers, and then uses some function to turn the signs of those floating point numbers into floating point numbers and then adds them. So, um, so the timing for this one is 193 milliseconds. I'll write that as 193e minus So milliseconds, one millisecond is 10 to the minus 3 seconds. So that's why I put E minus 3. This means in uh, computer notation, E and then a number is the notation that you use for scientific notation. So this is times 10 to the minus 3. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because the units, there'll be all kinds of different units that the time of command will output, like microseconds, nanoseconds, etc. So we'll always just write the number that it gives us, E to be um, Minus 3 for milliseconds, minus 6 for microseconds, and minus 9 for nanoseconds. Okay? That way we can compare the various timings. All right, so that's what we get. 193. Right. And I don't want to bother with 10 to the 4. I mean, I could, but... Well, I guess I can... Since it's so... Just do something like this. Time 10 to the 4. So, I mean, that's a noticeable amount of time just to do it once. So time it will repeatedly um, run the or evaluate the expression that's inside of the string, whereas time just does it once and outputs the result in seconds. So fifteen point eight eight seconds. Um, I don't need to put any anything there. Okay. It's actually worse than it's worse than ten times worse, isn't it? Um, because the first one was less than a second, so it's, it's really bad, this approach. But it's really natural. You might think, oh no, Sage is really slow because if I want to compute the, the, the floating point representation for the sum of the signs of the first integers, it's so slow. But um, I'll show you that there are like 20 different ways to do this, and some ways are dramatically faster than others. Okay, so uh, next, let's write something. The only difference, really, here is that instead of using the symbolic sign, which is a default sign function in Sage, we're using something that's in the math library that's part of Python. This is actually a lightweight wrapper around the sign function that's in the C library on whatever operating system you're using, I think, having not looked at the code. But I believe that's what it is. Um, so what this will do is the second it gets one of these integers, one of these Python integers, it will evaluate it, and that will be a double precision number. And then it will sum up those double precision numbers. So instead of getting some big formal sum and then collapsing it back down to a single float, it's only just going to add up a bunch of floats. Okay? And in the interest of being similar, I'll put x range there so it doesn't create the whole range of integers in memory and then iterate over them. Not that that would make much of a difference. Um, our, this 1,000 is kind of a double check. It should look like 0.8 something if it's correct. And now finally, let's do a timing. So we get 185 microseconds. Um, okay, so now what we're doing is timing what we call Python sum. And this is slightly more intelligent in that we used the sign function that immediately turns the result into a double, okay? Um, and that's the one that's in the math library, which is uh, built into Python. And that gave us a timing of 185 e minus 6 microseconds. That is a thousand times faster than the first one I showed you. That's pretty significant. A thousand times faster just by making that one change. Um, and let's just do the one other benchmark. This kind of gives a little bit of a sense of how things scale. 
So that one's 2.07 2 milliseconds. Thousands and thousands of times faster. Okay, so that was the first optimization. We turned our one-line function into a two-line function, and then we explicitly imported a different sine function. All right, now let's um, start being paranoid. Maybe we can do something better by getting rid of the sum. Maybe the sum is stupid, and maybe we should use a for loop. Who knows? Maybe that would be better. Just for fun, let's try that out. We haven't used Scythe on it at all yet, by the way, in case you're wondering. Um, so here, what I did was I replaced the sum by a for loop, and then I timed it, and it's actually slightly longer, but it's probably just variation in the timing. So it basically makes no difference at all to use a for loop. So I'll just note that. For loop, this one uses sum. And basically the same. All right, any questions? Okay, now we're going to try using Cyclone. Let's see what we get. We'll see what happens. Introduce Cython. I already did that. But now, um, here's how you use Cython in the Sage notebook. Uh, remember there were these various percent modes where you could, you could write percent uh, list and, use, and write a list program. You, just per, you could write percent uh, gap and write a gap program and so on. Um, Cython, just like that, you can write percent Cython and then write a Cython program that's in that cell. What happens when you do that is um, the Cython compiler is run. It turns your code into a .c file. It also just, because it's convenient, also generates an HTML file that lets you more easily browse the resulting generated code. By more easily, I mean dramatically more easily browse it, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, moreover, it takes all of the code that's defined, so all the functions that you've defined here, and makes them immediately available in your Sage session. So you don't have to do anything further. They're just there to use. Okay, um, first let me show you the auto-generated C. Well, first let's talk through this code. I put percent Cython at the top, and otherwise it's exactly the same. There's no change whatsoever to the rest of the code. Um, almost 90, probably, I don't know what the exact percentage is, because there's infinitely many Python programs, but um, most Python programs, you can just put percent Cython and compile them, and it should work. Pretty much most features of the language of the Python language are supported in Cython. There are some subtleties, though. Um, but for the most part, things are very, very similar. Yes. Oh, yeah, I should do that. Um, it won't make any difference for the auto-generated code, because what this actually does is it turns that into a for loop um, in the code, I think. But either way, it does that. Range or X range, it still doesn't construct a range at all. It makes it into a for loop, I think. Although that might actually depend on the data types. Maybe it only does that if I declare n to be a long. So never mind. So actually, that does matter. OK, good. So let's just make sure it's you know working. I'll show you the auto-generated code in a minute. Um, so it looks, it looks like it's working, and that number looks familiar. And uh, let's see how the timings look. So there are first attempt, um, 144 microseconds. Pretty comparable. It's not that much better than the Python version. It's a little bit faster. And 1.52 uh, milliseconds. So that's what we got for those two benchmarks. It's a little bit better. 144 is a little better than 185. But it's not you know, super, super exciting. Better. That's often what happens if you just take straight Python code and turn it into Cython code with no additional work at all. What you'll find is um, generally speaking, roughly a 30% speed up. Um, and this is what one finds overall if you run, say, the Python test suite through Cython and then try running it. Things do run more quickly than they do with just Python, but not that much quicker. So, so the uh, thing to take away from that is Cython with no extra thought typically gives you about 30%. It 
can, I'm not sure how true this is now, but uh, at various points in time, it could slow down your code as well. Um, but I don't know examples off the top of my head. And things depend somewhat on what your, you know, what computer you're on, what, how, how aggressive the optimizing compiler is, and so on. Okay, so let's move on and try something else. Let's try declaring types. So this is the first time we're going to actually change our code. I can make this full screen. Oh, I forgot to show you the annotated C code. Okay, so first, I shall terrify you with the um, auto-generated code. Um, hmm, where do, uh, so it got saved to a file on my computer. I do not want to run Xcode ever. Crash? Wow, I crashed Xcode. How exciting. Oh, I can crash Xcode if I want to. No, I don't. Okay, crash Xcode. Good. Um, wow. Uh, okay. Anyways, I have the code here. LS. Whoa. Um, oops. Okay, so here is the C code that was generated. The entire file is uh, 2,000. Oh, no. It's 2,523 lines of code from our two, two lines of code we started, or three lines of code we started with. It has all kinds of special stuff like if you know, you're not on Windows, do this. If you are on Windows, do that. Blah, 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 blah. There's all kinds of boilerplate. If you're um, using Python version 3 or bigger, do this. If you're using Python you know, 2.x, do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Tons and tons of code here. And then at some point, you would finally get to the code that involves things like the sign function, which is right there. Um, but it's pretty hard to look at, as you might imagine. So, oh, one thing that's nice, though, is and this is one of the things I added to my fork of uh, Pyrex. Um, right before, it, it does basically generate code line by line after all the boilerplates that corresponds to the code in your site on file. And I put some comments in, so point to you know, show you that line of code generates this. So defining a function in Cython, this is the um, C code that it generates. So it generates all kinds of declarations and stuff. Um, importing something from the math library does all of that. Uh, and then the sum, here's what the sum does. It's all that code. This is hard to look at, um, as you might imagine, and hard to deal with. So let's go back over here. I could if I have to give the right options, but yeah, I could directly compile it with GCC if I wanted to. Um, so now let's see, let's try the HTML file. Here's the HTML file. What it does is it gives you the program you wrote, and um, you can click on a line, and it will show you, or double click on a line, and it will show you the corresponding uh, C library code that it had to generate in order to uh, kind of convert that one line of code into C code, okay? And it colors it. The uh, line is yellow the more work it takes. So if you write a program in Cython, like some big program in Cython, you're wondering what parts are probably slow just based on stupidly calling, you know, getting expanded into something really big and calling lots of C functions in the Python C API. Then you just look to see which is the yellowest. The more yellow it is, the worse. So um, that's what these, the, coding, the color coding means here. This is very yellow. It would be nice if the whole program were just white. Then you think, oh, there's no calls at all to the Python C API. So there you are. Um, so that's what this is. And that's much easier to look at. You just double click and you can at least see what the functions are. Um, you can see what the code is and what the corresponding generated code is. Um, OK. I will show you. It's really easy. Anytime you use Cython, it always gives you, right after you use percent Cython, it gives you a link to the C file and a link to the HTML file. All you do is, I just clicked on the HTML file. And it will always pop it up in another window or another tab. It won't just you know, mess up your worksheet. So you just click on this. That's how you get it. Okay? So you'll see a funny looking file called something.html. Um, it's hard to see the .html because it's zoomed in, but here it is. Something.html, anytime you write Cython code. That's what this is. Okay? All right. So let's 
So we tested it out, it wasn't really much faster. So let's try something else. And this will illustrate doing something with Cython that, is, that goes beyond what you can do with Python. One of the main aspects of, of Python is that um, variables do not have a static type. It's, um, it's strongly typed in that every variable has a type, but the um, type can change during runtime. As a program runs, the type of a variable can change all over the place in Python. In Cython, on the other hand, you can, you don't have to, but you can declare variables to have some static C type or actually also a Python type. Like you could say that this variable must always be a Python list. This variable must always be a, a Python set, that sort of thing. Um, here what I've done is I've taken the various variables in my function and I've declared them to be long integers. So that's what this does. This says that the input variable n must is now a long integer. When the function gets called, it'll be turned into a long integer, which is a data type, which is either a 32 or 64-bit int, depending on your computer. And uh, this makes i a long integer as well. OK? And then we can run the code, see whether it's any faster. So it looks like it's no better at all. I mean, it's actually a little worse for some reason declaring the types, but I think that's just a variation in the timer. We can also look at the auto-generated code and see if it's any different. It's basically no different. Okay, so that didn't help at all. This is, it depends on what you're doing, whether or not that will help. Sometimes you can get a dramatic speed up of a factor of hundreds or thousands by declaring data types like this, and sometimes you can't. For example, if I were just summing the first n integers, um, by declaring the data types like this, the optimizing compiler would apply some transformation and use a formula that it would figure out on the fly, which would make this entire function take only nanoseconds, which is pretty impressive. Um, in fact, you might not believe me, so I'll just show you an example of that. Um, let's in say instead of doing this, I wanted to compute just the sum of the these integers. So, uh, no sign. Uh, oh, I have to, I think I have to do it as a for loop to get the optimizing compiler to work. So I have to do for i in range 1 through n plus 1. And I want to accumulate the sum somewhere, s equals 0, s plus equals i, return s. Yeah, so that takes 446 nanoseconds. And so does that. And so does that. It basically takes, it doesn't depend much on the size of the input, which suggests that it's not really doing an O of n algorithm. Um, it's the compiler has found a formula for the sum of the first n integers automatically. And it'll also do that if you put in like some, something like i times i minus i plus 1. It'll annoyingly also find a formula there. So um, that's the sort of thing you can get by declaring data types. Little bits of code can be automatically transformed into much more clever bits of code by your compiler. You have to watch out this. Sometimes it'll get transformed into much more clever code that actually computes something completely different. And in fact, with this very compiler using the, um, there's an extended GCD. So you know where you find a, uh, if you have two numbers, it'll find some other numbers so that the appropriate linear combination is the GCD. So that in fact gets messed up when you compile Perry using Xcode 4.2 and it will just silently um, compile the code and give you completely wrong answers, which is pretty disturbing. So watch out. Usually, that's called that's a bug in the compiler. It's supposed to, you know, the compiler transformations are supposed to always give you back something that gives you the same output, but that is not always the case in uh, real life. So whenever you're using a compiler, you may want to worry and make sure you have a good test suite. The Perry com the Perry test suite does pick up this problem. Okay, back to our story. So. Notice above the optimizing compiler did do something when I wrote a for loop instead of using sum. So let's try that down here. Um, maybe we'll get some better result if we use a for loop. Okay, so that's what I'll try next. Actually, it's not what I'm trying next. Um, but I'll try that in a minute. Here what I've done is instead of calling the sign function that's in the math library in Python, I'm directly calling the sign function in the C library math.h. If you um, 
you know, Google for math.h, you'll find that there are a bunch of functions that are available on any machine with a relatively modern C compiler, and sine is one of those functions. And um, I've explicitly declared it. So in Python, if you want to use a C function, you have to say, um, from this library, I'd like to use this C function. Um, and here you, do, here you are. So then I sum, and instead of saying math.sine of i, or using the sign that's in defined in Python, I'm using the sign that's defined in the C library. And just so you can see that it gives the same results. Yep. And notice the timings. How do they compare? Are they better? Yeah, finally we've got substantially better things. And then we'll come back to uh, unrolling the loop in the, or making a loop in a second. So now we've changed the um, sign function that's used. And we've declared types. And from doing that we get um, 85 to minus 6 and 951e minus 6. Okay, so that's great. That's a significant speed up, or at least a factor of uh, two again, roughly. Okay, so the key thing we just did between these two versions is Python. Before, Python has a function in Python that is called sign, and that function declared in Python, part of the Python library. Oh, okay. So we'll continue next time, and what we'll do is get rid of the sum and turn it into a loop. And then we'll see how fast that is, and that will give us an additional speed up. And then we'll look at how to symbolically find a closed form formula for the sum of the signs of integers. And then we'll implement a function using that, both in Python and Python. And at the end of the day, we'll get something that is 158,940 times faster than what we started with. Yes? What if, uh, what if a function calls new sign function, one from Python and one from C? Yep. And so then uh, if you run sign, which